All right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I'd like to start off by taking a moment to honor those that we've lost in our industry and those that we'd like to protect and that we do protect. So just going to take a moment, quick little pause for them. Thank you. Uh, so as, as I said, hi, I'm Jamie Tomasello. I've been combating internet abuse and addressing security and compliance issues for over 20 years at internet service providers, security companies, law firms, and nonprofits. I'm a certified information privacy professional, both CIPP US and CIP, uh, CIPT, and I'm currently completing my degree in interdisciplinary studies with double minors in trauma and resilience in sociology, and I'm a certified mental health first aid trainer. And in the past, I've presented on cognitive capacity, cognitive load, mental and emotional labor and burnout prevention. And presenting on these topics were important to me because my peers, leaders, and even myself here in this image in the hospital, were treating each other and ourselves like perpetual motion machines. We were failing to accept that forcing ourselves into work patterns that exhaust our personal energy would not lead to infinite productivity. Watching out for burnout isn't enough anymore. Honestly, it, it was never enough to begin with. And I'm here today about using trauma-informed approach principles in our industry and in our workplaces. You may be saying to yourself, hey, this isn't a cybersecurity topic. Why are you doing two non-IT topics at PancakesCon? Well, we need to be looking through a trauma-informed lens to better serve our customers, to develop better products, to create more accurate threat models, to better support our peers, and to better empower the teams that we lead. And if at any time during this presentation, the content is triggering in any way, please feel free to step away. You can always catch the content you've missed when it's up on YouTube, or you can contact me after the presentation. It's completely okay. Survival mode is supposed to be a phrase that helps save your life. It's not meant to be how you live. Unfortunately, over the past three years, we have faced a pandemic, political unrest and war, social and racial injustice, mass shootings, extreme weather events, and layoffs at a frequency and intensity that many of us have never experienced before. We've seen that during traumatic situations where there's a loss of control, people will throw themselves into something like work to compensate that lack of, for that lack of control or to avoid processing the traumatic event in their lives. This is toxic productivity. Toxic productivity isn't sustainable. It doesn't always yield the best results and it ultimately harms the worker. It's time to recognize that traditional wellness programs offered by employers are not enough. Working remotely, unlimited PTO, team-led meditation ex exercises, healthy snack options, and a four-day work week, those are all good and they're fine, but they don't wipe out three plus years of trauma. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration within the U.S. Department of Human Health, Human of Health and Human Services, developed uh, six key principles of a trauma-informed approach by integrating three significant threads of work. It's uh, trauma and uh, trauma-focused fo research work, practice-generated practice-generated knowledge about trauma interventions and the lessons articulated by survivors of traumatic experiences who have had involvement in multiple service sectors. And it was expected that this blending of research of practice and survivor knowledge would generate a, a, a framework for improving the capacity of service systems and public institutions to better address trauma related issues of their constituents. This approach has primarily been uh, encouraging the behavioral health, child welfare, medical, educational, and criminal justice systems, but it can be extended to any industry, even ours. So what do we mean by trauma? Individual trauma results from an event or series of events or set of ex experiences and circumstances that is experienced by an individual as a physically or emotionally harmful or is life-threatening. And that has lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning, mental, physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. And I can bet that many of you have experienced something that is traumatic over the past three years. I know I have. And two people may undergo the same event, like a pandemic, but have entirely different experiences or effects. 
some people may experience an event like in a divorce, but one person may be devastated and another person is relieved. People have different levels and kinds of resilience. One person may be very resilient against one kind of event, but not as resilient against another kind. How the individual labels, assigns meaning to, and is disrupted physically and, and psychologically by an event will contribute to whether or not it is experienced as a traumatic event. Traumatic events by their very nature set up a power differential where one entity, whether an individual, an event, a force of nature, has power over another. They elicit a profound question of why me? This individual's experience of these events or circumstances is shaped by the context of this power, powerlessness and questioning. Adverse effects may occur immediately or have a de delayed onset. The duration of effects can be short or long-term. In some situations, the individual may not recognize the connection between traumatic effects or traumatic events and their effects. A couple of examples of adverse effects that we typically see as a response to trauma or extreme stress are an inability to cope with the normal stresses and strains of daily living, an inability to trust and benefit from relationships, an inability to manage cognitive processes such as memory, attention, thinking, an inability to regulate behavior, and an inability to control the expression of emotions. It's not just being burnt out. It's about experiencing trauma and it's about processing and go getting through this trauma. Traumatic events, which may range from hypervigilance or constant state of arousal to numbing or avoidance can eventually wear a person down physically, mentally, and emotionally. How many people here have taken their hypervigilance or their constant state of arousal and turned it into a job skill? I know I did. Um, and unfortunately, that doesn't lead to a great outcome. So what do we mean when we talk about a trauma-informed approach? We talk about, in the, the trauma space, four R's. And it's a program organization or team that is trauma-informed, realizes the widespread impact of trauma, and it understands potential paths for recovery. It recognizes the signs and symptoms of trauma in their teams, peers, and customers. They respond by fully integrating the knowledge about trauma into policies, procedures, and practices, and they seek at to actively resist re-traumatization. A trauma-informed approach is distinct from trauma-specific services, and it's inclusive of trauma-specific interventions, whether it's an assessment, treatment, or recovery supports, yet it also incorporates key trauma principles into the organizational culture. This isn't a performative action. In the trauma-informed approach, people at all levels of the organization or system have a basic realization about the trauma and understand how trauma can affect teams, programs, organizations, and communities, as well as individuals. People's experience and behavior are understood in the context of coping strategies designed to survive adversity in overwhelming circumstances, whether these occurred in the past, whether they are currently manifesting, or whether they're related to emotional distress that results in hearing about the firsthand experiences of another. This is especially for critical, this is especially critical in our space for people working in trust and safety or those that respond to the abuse alias. The other way, the other thing that is really important as we think about this is, you know, how do we apply it to the products that we're building? And we have to think about stress, stress cases instead of edge cases. Uh, for folks who may not be familiar, there's a book called Design for Real Life. It's by Eric Meyer and Sarah Wachter, Wachter and if I mispronounced her name, I'm very sorry. Um, there's a chapter in here about incorporating stress cases, and it's specifically talking about how if we think about situations where our client or where our customer or our user um, is experiencing stress versus about stress testing the website, then we're, we're going to be able to anticipate um, a much different reaction, a different way that they're utilizing our services, and also we're going to be there when they need us in a different way. Uh, so I highly recommend reading chapter three on incorporating stress cases or reading the entire book around product design. Um, it's, it's, it's great when it talks about trauma and stress. 
So those six key principles that I was talking about, those uh, key principles of a trauma-informed approach that the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration put together, uh, they published them in this concept of trauma and guidance for a trauma-informed approach. And those six principles are safety, trustworthiness and transparency, peer support, collaboration and mutuality, empowerment, voice and choice, and culture, historical, and gender issues. Implementing a trauma-informed approach requires compassion and caring. It's not about learning a particular technique or checking off of a checklist. It's not the equivalent, the mental health equivalent of PCI DSS compliance. It's a way of being. It's looking at the world through a trauma-informed lens rather than a set of actions. You think about each of these principles and how you apply them to your interactions with your peers and your teams and your leaders and your customers. We're going to take a moment to ask and I will look in the Slack channel uh, to see how y'all think about those things. So the first one is, what does safety look like to you? How do you all think about safety? All right, so in the case of safety, employees feel physically and psychologically safe. Their interpersonal actions promote a sense of safety. For employees, generally, that means things like maximizing control over the work that they do in their environment and minimizing the risk to themselves. It's welcoming people in a welcoming environment. It's being consistent and predictable. It's non-shaming, non-blaming, non-violent. It's respectful of privacy and confidentiality. And there are clear explanations of what is happening and why. Oftentimes people aren't as upset if they just, if they just know what is happening and why it's happening. It's a lot easier for them to process even if they don't agree with the fact that it's happening. So another question, you know, what do you all think trustworthiness and transparency looks like? So I'll go back really quickly while y'all are thinking about some ideas on what trustworthiness or transparency looks like. Um, there's a, some folks have said that um, safety to them is being able to talk at a level that is comfortable to me. Um, you know, that's great. Like that is, thank you for sharing. That is something to think about as we think about what safety looks like. Um, there's another one that someone said, you know, when the employee is free to move about the cabin without ex external concerns, as they understand how to operate in the space with their peers, um, knowing what the plan is exactly, all of that makes a lot of sense. And all of that's great. Thank you for sharing. So some examples of what transparency and trustworthiness looks like. Um, conducting organizational operations and making decisions with transparency with a goal of building and maintaining trust. That kind of goes back to being told what the plan is ensuring people really understand their options. It's about being authentic. And I know a lot of times we say you can bring your full self to work, or you can bring your whole self to work or you know, bringing your authentic self to work. And for a lot of marginalized people, it's actually not safe for them um, to bring their whole entire self to work. They bring as much authenticity as they feel comfortable bringing, and that's okay. Uh, it also is about directing um, directly addressing limits of confidentiality and letting team members know if and when confidentiality can or cannot be promised. And as a leader, where your limits are on what you can share. Being really transparent around those limits, I think, reduces a lot of frustration and creates um, a lot more team spirit. And by team spirit, I don't mean it in the Nirvana deodorant way, but I mean it in the sense of you have a sense of community within your own team. And then the other thing to think about as it relates to trustworthiness and transparency is showing people dignity, respect, validation of their experience, and listening and being present in the most in the moment as you're building that safety and trust. Uh, somebody else mentioned that it is something that is built over time and putting forth messaging that's proven true repeatedly and being consistent, um, being able to tell the truth without the fear of reprisals and being in a collaborative welcoming environment and that you'll get a positive and constructive re response. Thank you all for sharing those. I really appreciate your thoughts. So what does peer support look like? 
as you all think about what peer support looks like, some, some things to think about are uh, peer support is a flexible approach to building mutual healing relationships among equals based on core values and principles. Peer support is voluntary, it's respectful, it's reciprocal, it's non-judgmental, and it's empathetic. How many of you have been put into situations where it wasn't voluntary or it wasn't reciprocal? or there wasn't an attachment of judgment to that support. So if we just think about what collaboration and mutuality looks like, it's about partnering, partnering and leveling power between our peers, between our team members, between employees and customers, and be, between leaders and their teams. This is something that I think it's a little bit challenging at times in the workplace moving from that control to collaboration and recognizing that 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 healing happens in relationships during the meaningful sharing of power and decision making and unfortunately not a lot of leaders feel comfortable doing that or that view it as a threat or view it as um like a power takeover it's not oftentimes by by pushing decision making down by delegating this it makes everybody bought in and it there are sometimes better decisions that are made it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily break the hierarchy or, or jeopardize the authority by delegating, um, by delegating power and decision making. So when we think about empowerment, voice, and choice, and we think about what they look like, um, it's where the individual's strengths and experiences are recognized and built upon. And it's not just our employees or our teammates and our, or our peers, but it's also our customers. It's something that we have to recognize that they have a voice and that their choices are validated and that the organization overall fosters a belief in resilience, not just for the customers, but internally as well. It's critical that we realize that we're not, we don't always know best for our customers and that our customers sometimes have experiences that are greater than our own uh, and that we're designing security and safety solutions that address their needs. Um, a good example of this is recognizing the experiences that folks in the Global South experience, users in the Global South, or from marginalized or jeopardized groups like domestic violence um, or intimate violence uh, victims. And so the last one to think about here is what does cultural, historical, and gender issue awareness look like? This is where an organization actively resists stereotypes. This is where they're being color conscious, conscience, but not being color blind. They recognize and address historical trauma like racism, sexism, immigration status, um, caste discrimination, and they make use of traditions when appropriate and proactively fosters cultural connections within and across communities. And then this isn't just a different way of thinking about diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. This is actually thinking about how can we value everybody's experiences and recognize what we've gone through, not just over the past three years, but through, throughout our cultural histories. And when we talk through these key prints, these six key principles, they're not that wildly different from the five key dynamics of high performing teams, according to research from Google. Google laid out that the number one thing that you need is psychological safety and then dependability, structure and clarity, meaning and impact build on from there. However, these six principles have more compassion automatically built in. For those of you who are people managers or are aspiring to lead teams, Becky Haas, who is a trauma informed community expert said that understanding about trauma is not just an eraser to take away the consequences of wrong choices, but it gives us an explanation for it now so that we can bring our programming to help people heal and not make those choices again. Trauma shouldn't be an excuse for poor performance or for bad behavior, but it gives you an extra layer to understand where these people, where people come from and what may be at play for, um, for their actions. Many of us research, identify, and discuss technical vulnerabilities, but we're not open to doing the same thing about our own normal human vulnerabilities out of fear of being exploited or by being viewed as weak by the very communities in which we trust for everything else. So we have to think about this from a sense of empathy as a community, not what's wrong with you, 
more of what's happened to you. What have you experienced? We want to drive connection in these times of isolation, siloing, and an over-focus on individual performance. We need to think about perspective taking, which is the ability to take the perspective of another person or to recognize their perspective as their truth. We want to stay out of judgment. It's so easy when we're talking to our peers or to folks who report to us and being judgmental in the conversation, but we have to stay out of that place of judgment and recognize the emotion in other people. And then the last thing as we think about empathy is we have to feel with people. And that doesn't mean that we have to sh have the exact same emotional reaction that they do. We can be therapeutic without being a therapist. Now, some of you may be thinking, Jamie, I am not good at these kinds of conversations. And not all managers become managers because they have a natural affinity for people, and that's okay. We have to recognize that some people become people managers because it was a new challenge, or it was the path available to them for career progression. And the ORS conversation model and structure can help facilitate conversations. So the way that we have these conversations that are more empathetic, whether they are um, as part of user conversations or whether they're parts of conversations with our peers or people who support to us or to our leadership, we ask open-ended questions. We provide affirmations, acknowledging someone's right to feel the way that they feel. We reflect back on what they say to show your understanding and active listening. And we take observation and summarize the conversation in a follow-up. And I know this is a lot. And I know that shifting to a trauma-informed approach within an organization is hard. But we can all start with what we control and influence, which is our actions with each other and with our customers. So let's not leave it to those who are the most marginalized and most harmed to start this. We all benefit from a more collective and a more compassionate approach. Many people who experience trauma readily overcome it and they continue on with their lives. Some become stronger and more resilient, but for others, the trauma is overwhelming and their lives get derailed. Some may get help in formal support systems. However, the vast majority will not. The manner in which individuals and families can mobilize the resources and support of their communities and the degree to which the community has the capacity, knowledge, and skills to understand and respond to these adverse effects of trauma have significant implement, implement, Im, implications for the well being of people in their community. When our interactions lead with compassion instead of as an afterthought, we create a protective factor that helps people fare better in the face of stress and heal after trauma. It helps people build resilience to adapt well in the face of adversity trauma or significant sources of stress in the future. Don't forget that you are not alone. So after focusing on taking care of each other and our community, it's time to focus on taking care of ourselves. Now, I regularly neglect to eat breakfast, even though I love French toast. So this recipe is going to feel like you're spoiling yourself without a lot of work. So we're gonna switch gears a little bit here. I know a lot of that was a lot of intense and a lot of thinking about, um, about others and how we process trauma. And this is going to be an opportunity for us to feed ourselves, not just physically, but uh, a way to uh, come together and be able to feed others as well. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and make this live for the remainder of the time that I have. Um, so this recipe is from food.com and Epicurious Magazine, and it's my absolute favorite recipe for both its ease and its flavor. Um, so I'm going to be switching gears here and I'm gonna stop sharing and we'll start making food. Um, if there are particular things that looks like in the Slack channel, uh, there's a question about ores and what was reflections. Um, I'm happy to answer that really quickly while we switch gears here, but reflections is reflecting back on what they say to show your understanding and active listening. Uh, I hope that helps. So, okay. So, thank you, Jamie. There was also one question about what was the name of the book that you were talking about right at the beginning of your sure. um, talk? So this book right here, it's called Design for Real Life by Eric Meyer and Sarah Wachter Bacher. Um, it's by the publisher, A Book of Part. Highly, highly recommend this. Um, 
It's essentially how to identify stress cases and how to anticipate emotional states um, of your users and in your design process. It's quite helpful. Okay, Docs, thank you. Yeah, of course. All right. Am I free to flip over and stop sharing? Thanks. All right. All right. So what we have here for all French toast recipes, they're composed of three components, right? Um, we've got bread, we've got custard, and we've got flavorings. So let me plug in this griddle, get this heating up while I'm talking through this. So I find that French toast is easily adaptable as long as you keep those core components uh, in mind. So the bread that we're using today is what I consider the ideal French toast bread, or for this recipe at least. So this is crackling bread um, from Zingerman's. Um, it is a brioche bread that has been um, soaked with Grand Marnier sugar cubes, and then it's got like a, a, a dusting of it on the top, which is really nice. Um, it is available here in Ann Arbor, um, and it's also available from their mail order. Now, other good options when you're making a French toast are Dale brioche bread. Um, if you have fresh brioche bread, it's going to be too soft and it's not going to be able to absorb that custard that we talked about earlier. Or challah bread. Uh, it's also a really great bread for making French toast. So for gluten-free and for vegan options, ultimately consider a bread that doesn't crumble apart. You need a bread that can absorb that custard um, however you make it. And we'll talk a little bit about vegan custards and how I recognize that custard typically has eggs. Um, so this recipe has four eggs and it has a uh, three fourths of a cup of half and half, traditionally, two tablespoons of sugar. And I actually like altering this recipe with half heavy cream and half whole milk. And I've made it with just heavy cream before and it makes it extremely rich or only whole milk in the past because that's what I had and it still works. It doesn't work really well with skim milk. I haven't tried it with soy, but give it a shot. A lot of these recipes are really adaptable. Now, if you're seeking a, a true non-dairy and egg-free option, uh, one of the best custard shortcuts when you need to get rid of eggs and the dairy is to take your favorite vegan vanilla ice cream and let it soften in the refrigerator. Now, the one that I've heard is the best so far is the Oatly Vanilla Frozen Dessert. And uh, it's a great place to start. And you're like, Jamie, why are you making me put ice cream in my fridge toast? Well, most ice creams are custard based um, and the vegan frozen desserts that are very similar to ice cream and very similar to custard uh, work really well. So let it soften and then stir it up or whisk it so that it's completely smooth and you can follow the remainder of the steps um, without using eggs or dairy. So now we're on to our flavoring our section. Like our, our key components of flavoring are a quarter cup of Grand Marnier right there um, and a half teaspoon of vanilla extract and a tablespoon of grated orange peel. Now, if you don't like or you don't have Grand Marnier, you can substitute in another orange flavored liqueur. But if and if you're a person in recovery like me, you can choose or you choose not to drink alcohol for medical, personal, or religious reasons. The best replacement for it is this Minute Maid um, frozen orange concentrate. What I don't recommend using are things like the Tarani or the Monin coffee or um, Italian soda syrups, those are too cloyingly sweet as a replacement. And um, plain orange juice doesn't bring in enough flavor. So all you have to do is thaw this and use the same proportion. So I think it's a, a quarter cup for this recipe of the frozen concentrate. And then the vanilla extract we're using today is the Sawyer's Pure Vanilla Extract. I like this one for some reason. It has like a, like a home style vanilla flavor. Um, but if you want a really strong punch of vanilla flavor, I recommend this vanilla extract that was vanilla beans extracted in rum um, by Don Olivio's in Costa Rica. But any pure vanilla extract will do. Please don't use imitation vanilla extract. It won't turn out. So we mix all of these ingredients together, right? We have our eggs, our heavy cream. We have our whole milk, our Grand Marnier, our sugar off to the side, all in this bowl, and our grated orange peel together. And then what we do is we really simply just take our bread and we dip it in the bowl until, you know, we just draw it out and then let it just sort of ooze out and put it in a deep 
dish. So I have this in a pie plate today. You can put it in your typical like 13 by nine lasagna pan. It doesn't have to be fancy. It just needs to be deep enough for you to set these things in. So you put them in there. We're gonna do three or four. Um, usually this will do a whole loaf of bread and then some. So the proportions of this work out really well for having a lot of leftovers. Um, you may say, Jamie, I don't need that much French toast. And I will say, yes, you do. Because the best part about this French toast is that it freezes amazingly well. And when you freeze this French toast in um, two Ziploc freezer bags, the quart bags, I put two slices in there at a time. Um, what ends up happening is it freezes great and you can put it in your toaster the next day or any day for that matter. Uh, and it's just two minutes, very similar to an egg -a waffle. Uh, you can put it in a toaster or a toaster oven and it tastes identically the same. So that's awesome. So then we take the bread that we've dipped and we cover it with cling film or press and seal, whatever you prefer, and you put it in your fridge. Um, you need to put it in there for a minimum of 30 minutes. Anything longer than 30 minutes um, is fine, but just keep in mind it's going to affect the integrity of your bread. So if you have a heartier bread that can withstand it, go ahead, keep it in there for up to overnight. Um, it kind of gets a bread pudding kind of creme brulee-ish type texture because it's a really thick custard at that point. Um, but if you like that texture, awesome. These that I have just pulled out of our magic refrigerator have been in there for about an hour. So what we do is we go ahead, pull them out. And we can either go ahead and switch gears so you can see what I'm doing here. I prefer the electric skillet. The electric skillet is great because you can maintain the temperature really well um, compared to a regular skillet that I tend to burn my French toast every single time. So you just go ahead and butter your skillet. And then it is three to four minutes on each side. And that's really all it takes. Pretty simple. And you let it cook till they're golden brown. Make sure that your French toast, um, I'm sorry, make sure that your skillet is on a medium temperature. I have it here at about 300 degrees. Um, the electric skillet is actually really affordable and probably one of the most affordable gadgets I have in my kitchen. Um, I got it on a Black Friday deal from Walmart. And usually those are on sale from Walmart or Target um, or your equivalents at any time during the holiday season. So um, while this is cooking, if there are any other additional questions about how to make this, be more than happy to answer them for you or other alternatives. Um, or if you have any additional questions about the trauma presentation, happy to answer them as well. There weren't all that many questions. Um, th there was one question. Uh, where was it? Uh, sorry, I wasn't. I wasn't expecting that. There, there's just a, a lot of discussion about alternatives and how to make uh, vanilla extract uh, and how to use vegan uh, ice cream as opposed to cream. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. So you know it's. It's actually, as, as uh, some folks have mentioned, it's actually really easy to make extract, vanilla extract. Um, so if you feel like you wanna do it by all means, feel free. Um, but there are lots of great ones out there. It's just, please use the real thing versus the imitation. You'll have another, um, you know, you'll have a much different experience if, <laughs> if not. Um, I will say the other thing about this, um, that I've learned it, the process of making breakfast and feeding myself um, has set my day to be a much better day when I start with a self-care activity um, and making that time. And I recognize that, you know, as a single mom of a, of a, of a kid, it's hard to do and make time for yourself or even make breakfast for yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think it's really important to, you know, hey, can I make a whole, a whole bunch of these on Sunday? And then go ahead and freeze them and take care of yourself through the rest of the week. So I love that idea. Yeah. My, my, my breakfast usually ends up being coffee and that's <laughs> it. So being able to freeze this and then just, you know, quickly doing, putting it in a toaster. That's an amazing idea. 
Thank you. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, it's 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 funny because a lot of folks are like, "Oh, does it really taste the same?" Just putting like popping it in the toaster like an ego. Yes, it is, and it's wild. Um, the other great thing is with this crackling bread, you don't need powdered sugar, you don't need butter, and you don't need maple syrup because it's just sweet enough the way it is. Um, so if you really want, you know, splurge on one um, splurge on one ingredient, I highly recommend making it with this particular bread from Zingerman's. I think Kat posted the link, um, but I also have the link directly to that bread that I could post in the track a little bit later. Um, but yeah, it is, is it? quite decadent and lovely. The other question that we got, so I'm not sure if you if you know offhand where that ores uh, came from. The, the origin. Did, oh, the origin of ores. Um, ores mm -hmm. has been around for a while. Um, it was part of my trauma training initially um, mm -hmm. about about that. But off the top of my head, I don't know who came up with um, the ores model specifically. Um, okay. I could go back and and pull that up it's but yeah it was part of uh, my mental health first aid training as a model or a framework to ask questions okay cool and have conversations mm -hmm. and i highly recommend um if if you're in the united states to take the mental health first aid training if you haven't taken it before it teaches you some additional things to help you support your peers um if you are very, if you are interested in providing additional support to people um, who may be dealing with mental health challenges or even stress or trauma okay the, the other the other question that came up is are you allowed to make french toast at a pancakes con and i think the answer to that is we can do what we want <laughs> i know i was gonna say you could ask leslie but um i think that as long as it's dough you know fried on on heat it's the same thing so we can argue that <laughs> <laughs> um but you know as long as it's breakfast i think it's fair game yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we can do what we want. Yeah. Cool. I think that's all the questions that we've got. So yeah, of course. Everyone's just staring hungrily at your yeah. screen. <laughs> I know. There you go. So it's still cooking, but uh, yeah, ultimately there's that. Uh, somebody just asked what was the name of the training that I just men mentioned. Yes, it is mental health first aid training. <laughs> You can Google that mental health first aid and it should be, I think it's even mental health first aid org um, and that you can have that training. If you're really interested in it, let me know. Um, one of the things that I've been thinking about doing because I am a certified mental health first aid trainer is offering a, a virtual training to specifically for folks in our space. So if there are folks who are very interested in mental health first aid training, um, reach out to me and then I could probably do a virtual training for a group of us. Yes, the UK one is related to it. The mental health first aid training that came out of the United States or that is in the United States is based off the mental health UK, or I'm sorry, the mental health first aid model in Australia. Okay, yes, I've done that one. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you all very much for your time. If you would like to reach out to me, please feel free to reach out with me over Slack. I'm also available at jtomasello, T-O-M-A-S-E-L-L-O -L -L -O, at gmail.com or on Twitter or on Mastodon. So thanks again for your time. And it looks like all these toasts are finished. So it looks like I'm going to have lunch or I'm going to have breakfast for the rest of the week. <laughs> You're going to have to show us one to this uh, to, to to your camera quickly, please. Sure. Beautiful toast. How good that looks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> th th thank you very much. Um, You're welcome. Yeah, we're going to go on to our next our next speaker soon. All right. Thank you, thank you very much, everyone.